Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Empty Cloud Monastery. So we're here for another session of Monk Chat. So everyone's favorite Friday night program, uh, much better than whatever's on Netflix these days. Uh, so uh, here's your opportunity to ask questions about Buddhism. Uh, and there are no less than three monks here who may possibly give you answers. Maybe one answer, maybe two answers, maybe even three answers. Uh, and we have no topic restriction as long as it's at least somewhat related to Buddhism. Uh, then we'll be happy to um, give you some kind of answer. So Monk Chat is fueled by questions. Uh, so when there are questions, the questions will be answered. When there are no questions, then the answers will stop and the live stream will end. Uh, so yesterday we had many off-topic questions which were not related to the topic of the conversation. And it was recommended to bring those off-topic questions to Monk Chat. So hopefully some of those questions will appear here tonight and we can answer them. Um, otherwise, I see a few friends joining in already. Uh, so hello to John, Karen, Yankee, and Vivian. Uh, and also I see many other people who have joined in but are, are not speaking yet. So please, if you want us to answer some questions, please go ahead and type in questions, anything whatsoever in the field of Buddhism. Uh, and just some introductions for those who don't know. Uh, to my right is Ayasoma. Uh, to my left is Bhante Jayasara, and I am Bhante Sudaso. I'm not Yutadama. <laughs> <laughs> Bhante Yutadama is a different monk who <laughs> kind of vaguely resembles me a little bit, but, but really not that much. Yeah, this is coming for those who are just joining in. <laughs> I'm uh, wearing it live uh, yesterday evening. Someone assumed that Bhante Sudazo was Bhante Yutadamo, hence the clarification tonight. That has, that's happened periodically for the past seven years, by the way. That's true. It's been a recurring <laughs> theme in my life. Uh, people every now and then, sometimes even in person, people will call me Yutadamo. Uh, though that hasn't happened too much these days. Maybe they call so, Bante Yutadamo Bante Sudaso. Who knows? <laughs> maybe. Maybe. It's like, oh, Bante Sudaso, you've gotten a lot taller and skinnier. <laughs> ah, we have a question. Yankee asks, have you ever heard Christians speak in tongues? If you have, does it sound anything like Pali? No, I have never heard Christians speaking in tongues. Either of you? Yeah, I mean, on, on like TV, like in documentaries and stuff like that. And no, it doesn't sound like Pali. It sounds mm, like chaotic gibberish, really. Like all the speaking and speaking in tongues is not even just a Christian thing. It's a pretty ancient thing. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of like making up words in a way. There there's, doesn't seem like there's much of a orderliness to it at least from what I've experienced. Okay. And I think I'm, I don't think I ever heard the actual um, um, ceremony, you might call it, um, like church gathering or whatever, where people um, speak in tongues. But I have met someone who had been there, our friend Antoinette actually, and hmm. she did it live here at Empty Cloud. And it did not sound like Pali. Hmm. <laughs> I remember Antoinette. Yeah. Hmm. So that's all I can say on, <laughs> on the and, subject matter. And I have zero experience. So I, I can't say anything at all. Um, Jay Kala says, could you speak on how you personally view interactions between practitioners and devas? Do you find it relevant to practice in any way on the path to Nirvana as opposed to good rebirth? Uh, personally, I don't really view it as, as much of anything at all. Uh, some people, uh, whether they're Buddhist or not, some people develop the ability to communicate with devas. 
Um, some people temporarily experience that when in altered states of mind. Other people cultivate a more reliable ability uh, through deep meditation practice or just as a result of past karma. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody is on the path to awakening or even the path to a heavenly rebirth. Uh, it's it's a bit like if you if you learn sign language, well, now you can communicate in sign language. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to Nibbana. It just means you know how to communicate in a particular way with a particular kind of person. So uh, learning how to communicate with devas is a relatively rare uh, and special ability. Um, but it's not particularly special in the sense that it doesn't necessarily develop wisdom and it doesn't necessarily lead to awakening. And it doesn't necessarily have anything whatsoever to do with Buddhist practice. Throughout human history, lots of people have learned how to talk with spirits of various kinds. Um, but that doesn't mean that they were on a path to awakening. I'd like to cover a, um, another aspect of this. So uh, interactions between practitioners and devas. And this brings up to me the whole concept of the devas protecting somebody. And that's an interesting concept. Like, the, you know, like we see an example in the Metta Nisangsa Sutta, the, the benefits of Metta. One of the, one of the benefits is that the devas protect one. But I don't know that in the suttas we see any examples of that short of devas like coming to monks who are doing bad things and saying, you know, like, hey, <laughs> what are you what are you doing? <laughs> you know, get your act together. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know exactly how devas would protect one. I and mean, I know, you know, even in Mahamangala Sutta, day and night they bring you offerings, therefore protect them. Um I, I don't exactly know how that happens, but you know, it's interesting. Sometimes I have felt like when I've been in the woods, like I, I have felt um, feelings of not protection per se, but safety. And sometimes mm -hmm. I felt not. And I thought, well, is, is that Deva's? Is that something? Or is it just my mind? I don't know. Um, I've not seen nor spoken to Deva, so I cannot confirm <laughs> either way. Um, but but yeah, the, the quality of the, the devas protecting and interacting with humans in that way, I mostly they're just blissing out. So I don't even know why they bother with humans for the most part. But I guess it depends on the deva. Yeah, that's all I, I just wanted. When I saw interactions, I figured I'd break up that part too. And here's a question, which I assume I might like to answer. Bhavani asks, how to know that one has mind? I actually wanted to say something about the previous one. Oh, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, also because I want to skip that question. <laughs> mug fun, mug chat. Um, no, I was thinking about the interactions between practitioners and devas and what was coming to mind was actually um, a while back, uh, a monastic friend of ours um many years ago actually he said something along the lines of oh in you know in the in the suttas you see so many interactions you know with the with the divine as contrarily to today um probably because back then people were a lot more inclined to be in um in uh, sort of interaction with uh, with the divine more open um, the karmic conditions were there as opposed to today. We have a bit, um, he didn't add this, but this is my um, commentary. <laughs> today we live in a very materialist world, so we tend to have um, a bit of a harder time um, interacting in such a sort of um, common way with, uh, with divinities. Because, I mean, in the suttas, it's pretty commonplace. It's not like it's not spoken like it was... Um, Sometimes even that particular of an event, actually, as Bhatti Jay was um, was describing, actually, those are some of my favorite suttas in the Samyutta Nikaya, like the devas coming to scold the bhikkhus, and it's something they were like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, you know, like, oh, the, the, the divinity is coming, but rather it's mm, kind of like a naughty, like, mm, <laughs> not naughty, like, you know, coming 
you are the naughty one. And <laughs> the deva is kind of like, it reminds me of my grandmother maybe when <laughs> she would come and go like, what are you doing? I see you. <laughs> Stop slacking out um, and that kind of stuff. But I have to say that before Buddhist practice, I had zero interactions um, with the divines, but also like zero thoughts about the divine altogether. Um, but after Buddhist practice, there is something, I mean, I still have zero interactions with the divine, <laughs> but something has changed in terms of how I relate to a space where there has been um, either incredible practitioners um, who have been there and worshipped devas or ancient places of practice, not necessarily Buddhist um, either. Um, like it can be any kind of religion. So actually this was happening to me a lot in um, in Italy and our last trip that we would go in, in different um churches in the middle of nowhere also like in when we were going up the mountain right Bante, and there were these kind of like signs um where they were pilgrimage routes so uh it was where different pilgrims had his for millennia basically had um stopped there and and worshiped mother mary there was something just really special really beautiful really energetically um profound i don't know how to describe it and so that had something gracious something divine about it and it was just so easy to do meditation um metta meditation for me in in those um situations also when we went to the franciscan nuns monastery i just sat in their church it was just so beautiful and then tan, in two minutes my in two seconds sorry i'm, I'm uh, my heart opened up and um, it was just really beautiful. So I don't know if that is an interaction with uh, with devas per se, um, but definitely there is something, something there. And Jake Kala had a follow-up. They said, to clarify, I mean more in a ritualistic way in the sense of fostering a relationship with devas through some kind of merit, offering prayer, etc. Some countries talk of interacting with local spirits. Yeah, and I think it's fine to do these sorts of things. Uh, I don't believe they're a necessary component of Buddhist practice. Uh, but I think generally speaking, it's it's actually good to be on a on friendly terms with the locals wherever you go. So whether those locals are corporeal or incorporeal, you should still try to be on good terms with them. Uh, so uh, actually, usually whenever I'm going somewhere, I, I Try to cultivate a sense of, of respect and courtesy towards the local spirits. Actually, our friends um, from the Thai community here, they donated a beautiful Buddha statue. Um, and before it arrived, because in that place where it's currently now installed, there used to be a statue of Mother Mary. And uh, the statue of Mother Mary had been there for several decades. We decided to donate it to a community of Catholic nuns in the same lineage. Uh, but the uh, the Thai community, they're such lovely people, full of metta. They actually made offerings to Mother Mary, um, asking her for permission to um, put the new Buddha statue there. And it was just so beautiful, you know, um, before, during and after uh, to see the incredible wholesome mind states that that generated. So I think, I mean, it's um, if it produces wholesome mind states, then yeah, sure, go for it. If it produces unwholesome mind states, then maybe not, not that great. Okay. And while you're at it, don't forget the yakas. Mm -hmm. Just like Bonte says, make peace with the locals. Yeah. And so then coming to Bhavani's question, which Ayasama says she doesn't want to answer, how to know that one has mind? Uh, well, first off, I would rephrase the question. I would say how to know that there is mind. Um, but uh, pay attention. What is it that's paying attention? What is it that seeks to know whether or not there's mind? Uh, that's mind. So mind is that which knows. The mind is that which pays attention. Mind is that which is aware. Uh, so the fact that you're asking how to know that there is mind is already proof that there is mind. Uh, 
And so, yeah, pay attention to awareness, pay attention to mind itself, and you'll realize it's there. Um, but it's not quite a correct question to say how to know that one has mind, because that already presumes that there is a person and that that person is in possession of something. So that's an incorrect statement, like in the Molya Paguna Sutta. Uh, where Molya uh, Molya Paguna keeps asking questions, and the Buddha keeps saying that's not the right end. That's not the right question, because Molya Paguna keeps saying things like, "Who is it that feels? Who is it that knows? Who is it that this?" And the Buddha is like, "Wrong question. Wrong question. Wrong question," um, because it's not correct to start with the assumption that there is a who that is capable of feeling and knowing and such. So similarly, it's not correct to start with the assumption that there is a, a one, a person, who has a mind. But rather, we start with acknowledging that there is an experience of mind uh, which appears to be happening. Uh, and then we start investigating the causal nexus which uh, generates this experience, and also investigating how uh, desire, aversion, and delusion interact with that to produce suffering that's more relevant to Buddhist practice. Okay, anything else? Okay. Then TJ, I think this is directed at me. Yeah. How many chapters in Dhammapada do you translate in Sutta Central? I love your translation. I'm happy you like them. That motivates me to put up the rest of them. <laughs> uh, in the past, I had translated the entire Dhammapada, which uh, you can put mine on the list of about 100 different English translations of the Dhammapada, uh, which is probably why I wasn't particularly motivated to upload it, because I you don't, don't really need another English translation of the Dhammapada. You already have 50 different options. Um, <laughs> but I, I should, I should get around. Someone in America says yes, so we need it. <laughs> okay, I second okay, that okay. thought. <laughs> okay, fine, fine. I'll, one of these days I'll get around to uploading the rest of it. Um, it takes time because I, I don't just upload it directly, but I, I go through it word by word again and revise the translation. Um, yeah, one of these days I'll get around to it. And hello to Monica, one of our friends from Italy. Good to see you. And Sud says, also for me, in Chundi Sutta, what does the Buddha mean by sila that is dear to the noble ones? That's the sutta I spoke about this morning. So the sila that's dear to the noble ones is, well, briefly speaking, it's the wholesome, virtuous conduct, which is beneficial both to oneself and to others, uh, and which is supportive of awakening. And that's what's meant by the virtue that is dear to the noble ones. And hello also to Thinnery. And uh, another question from TJ how to deal with distractions when practicing mindfulness and meditation. Bhante J, do you want to talk about this? Sure. Um, well, it depends on what you mean by meditation. <laughs> um, yeah. So <clears throat> when, if you're trying to focus your mind, the fact that the mind gets distracted is showing you that the mind has craving. It's showing you that the mind does not is like a little three year old that you try to grab and say and say stay there and it just wiggles away and just does its own thing, right? The mind is is not going to listen to you, especially in the beginning. So when you have distractions, especially things that um, the mind finds more interesting then the mind is just naturally going to drop whatever you're trying to make it do and go towards those distractions and get wrapped up in them and, and start to try to enjoy them. Right? Even, if, even if it's not necessarily something enjoyable, if it's something more interesting than what you are trying to have the mind do, the mind will go. <clears throat> right? When you have, when, when you have such um, tranquility of mind, uh, such um, a mind that is so focused and so content on, say, the breath, then anything could be happening around you. And it just, none of it matters. It's just like, yeah, well, whatever. I'm just really content to be here following the breath. Right? And, and that can be a bit more of an advanced thing. Um, 
But yeah, distractions, distractions are your mind showing you it's craving that. And so you can learn from that. If you're practicing something like a mindfulness of breathing, then try to gently come back to the breath. If you're practicing like a, uh, a mindfulness that is, you know, in all of your activities as you're wandering around, um, you know, that is a perfect example of investigating chitta nupassana, right? Observing the mind as mind, observing the mind with greed and mind without greed, mind with hatred, mind without hatred, etc. Observing the mind with craving, mind without craving. You know, you watch your mind, watch your, uh, what your mind does. Now, and then you can learn from that. You can gain wisdom from that. Okay. Okay. And Janta says, can you explain Dukkha Samudaya? <laughs> You've been experiencing Dukkha lately. I am experiencing Dukkha right now. I'm actually mm -hmm. having a bit of a um, <laughs> health issue. Um, but... Please, Bhante. Okay. Um, yeah, so briefly speaking, in every moment, pay attention to your own experience. So you don't need an explanation of Dukkha Samudaya. You just need to look at your own mind. And every moment, you'll see Dukkha Samudaya. You'll see Dukkha arising in every moment. So just watch. Every moment is painful. Every moment is a, another, another punch in the stomach. Uh, it's just the details that vary. Uh, so pay attention. Be willing to face your own dukkha. See what it feels like. Don't shy away from it. Don't ignore it. Turn your attention towards it completely. Pay attention to it. And notice what causes and conditions lead to more dukkha uh, or to the dukkha being more intense. Uh, and notice what causes and conditions lead to the dukkha weakening. Uh, and in this way, you will come to a deeper understanding of the Four Noble Truths, not as a concept, but as an experience, as a practice. Uh, so the Four Noble Truths are, are not meant to just be an idea that we think about. They're, they're meant to be guidelines for how to attain awakening. Uh, so what is Dukkha Samudhya? Well, look at your own experience. Look at your own mind. Pay attention to your own dukkha and notice how it comes into being and what causes it to strengthen and what causes it to weaken. And of course, if you pay attention, you'll realize that it's exactly what the Buddha said, that when there's desire, aversion, and delusion, then we have more dukkha. Uh, when there's less desire, aversion, and delusion, then there's less dukkha. Uh, so this is what you'll notice. Anything else on that? Dukkha Samudhya? Okay. And Dharma Learner asks, did the Buddha speak Pali and would Sanskrit texts not be original oral sutras of the Buddha? Uh, to be perfectly honest, we actually don't know what language the Buddha spoke. Uh, Pali was most likely a later homogenization of the texts, um, which happened relatively early on, but we don't know exactly when. The Buddha most likely spoke in several closely related Prakrit dialects, which were in usage in northern India at the time, um, and which were homogenized into Pali at some point. So the Pali suttas are probably not direct verbatim quotations from the Buddha, but they're probably pretty close for the most part. Um, the Sanskrit texts, again, some of it, might be pretty close to things that the Buddha directly said. Some of it might not be. Um, so uh, I wouldn't get too caught up on on the language. I would pay more attention to the content. It doesn't really matter whether or not Pali was exactly the language the Buddha used. What matters is, uh, is it a sufficient vehicle for communicating the concepts that the Buddha was trying to teach? And Jerry says, how can one discern the difference between mind and mind consciousness? One of you want to take this? Um, if you're discerning anything, you have consciousness. <laughs> you, if, if you're not, if you're not conscious, then you don't have, um, you know, mind consciousness. 
Yeah, and if you want to draw a line between the two, you might say that mind is the field uh, in which mental objects appear, and mind consciousness is awareness of the objects appearing in that field. That might be a distinction that you could make. Um, but uh, honestly, you really don't need to go into these distinctions, to be perfectly honest. I'm not really sure it's it's necessary. Uh, but if you wanted to make a distinction like that, you could make a distinction like that. Okay, good. And next one, James Lee says, I have a basic Dharma question. What is the relationship between the concept of emptiness and non-self? So that's not a basic Dharma question. So <laughs> maybe you also have a basic Dharma question, but you chose to not mention it and instead mention an advanced Dharma question. What is the relationship between emptiness and non-self? So these are two of the most advanced concepts in Buddhism, um, but also two of the most critically important ones. Uh, so emptiness, uh, fundamentally, emptiness is talking about how phenomena cannot be described either as existing or as not existing. It's the most basic description of it. Uh, and since things cannot ultimately be said either to exist or to not exist, then that means that they have no self-existence, uh, which in, in Sanskrit it's called svabhava. This is a term which which we don't find in the Pali canon, but it comes up in the Sanskrit literature. Uh, so things have no self-existence in and of themselves, but rather they they can be spoken of in terms of their relationship to other things. Uh, and uh, so non-self then is that this, this body-mind, since it's insubstantial, it has no inherent existence, uh, then it cannot be our, our ultimate true self. Uh, it's something which is constantly appearing and disappearing and changing. Uh, so there's no persistent, ongoing, solid, stable anything here. Uh, and because there's no persistent, ongoing, stable, solid anything here, then there's no persistent self here either. In Jeff, terms of the in yeah. terms of the suttas, though, the few times that Sunyata is described isn't it almost always described in relation to not self though no? anatta one of the basic definitions in the pali canon is that sunyata means um empty of self uh, that there is nothing here which is self or belonging to a self or related to a self it's one of the basic definitions of of emptiness in the pali canon actually our monastery called the empty cloud i think that gives a, a really nice visual <laughs> of the relationship between emptiness and non-self yeah. like go grab a cloud for example try to ground it even from a plane from the wind <laughs> don't try this at home <laughs> we're on a plane <laughs> you just go right through and yet spoiler something seems <laughs> to be there so something seems to be there, and yet you can't quite grab it. Yeah, it's a little wet. So you can't say there's nothing there, but at the same time, you can't say there's something there. Yeah. You just can't grab it. Yeah. And it's dependently arisen. Yeah. Sometimes it appears to be there. Sometimes it doesn't appear to be there. Uh, and it's not what you think it is. And it's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. John says, what resources would you recommend to someone wanting to learn Pali? I answer this all the time. Do either of you want to answer this? Yeah. De Silva Pali Primer. That's number one. Yeah, also the digital Pali reader actually is excellent. Um, there is actually a few new sources. Um, there is a new dictionary. Actually. Uh, Golden Dict. Gold, yeah, yeah I Golden Dict. That out. Just shoots digital poly reader out of the water. I don't even use DPR anymore. Golden okay. Dict is amazing. I haven't tried it yet. Yeah. And, and the fact that you can have it offline on your computer is also great. You can also um, get DPR yeah. offline. Yeah. 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 So it does. Is, is gold, is Golden running. Dict actually <laughs> goes deeper into like roots and suffixes and prefixes. It's mm -hmm. actually been really beneficial for me in the last couple of months. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, I want to check it out. I just heard of about it from Bhantananda Jati the other day. 
Okay. And but, well, I just do oh. want to say the um, the De Silva Poly Primer. If you Google it, I think the the last version is what two thousand eight. That's on PDF. You can find it on PDF. I mm. think two thousand eight. If you Google De Silva Poly Primer, and you should get the PDF for free online. Yeah. Um, also, Bante Bodhi uh, recently released a book. Uh, what's it called? Reading mm. the Buddha's words or something like that. Mm. Yes, in Pali, and yes, yeah. that's actually a very good, good book. We have a few copies here in the the library. I can't remember the exact name, but anyway, you can. There is um, essentially the both the Pali text and the translation in English, and then the explanation word by word. Mm. Um, that then will be called body did and explanations on both grammar and meaning and nuances. Mm. It's done really well. Mm. Okay. And Manny says during meditation break, thoughts of craving and aversion pop up. And if the mind follows it, how do we stop it? Just stop. It's kind of like someone who's running and they ask, how can I stop running? It's like, just stop stop running so it's actually exactly the same with our mind it's just we're so used to running our mind all the time that we actually forget it's possible to stop so sometimes you need to forcefully redirect your mind to something else and then notice the fact that you stopped so actually mantras are, are really great for this uh, literally any mantra is fine um, pick one that you like uh, can even just be a single word in your native language uh, like focus or peace, um, or it can be a, a word in Pali or Sanskrit. A very popular one in Thailand is to say Buddha. So just saying Buddha, Buddha, Buddha over, over, over and over again. Of course, in Vajrayana Buddhism, they have lots of mantras of every length you could possibly hope for, including very short ones and very long ones. It doesn't really matter. Just pick one that you like and just keep repeating it over and over again. And then you'll notice, oh, those thoughts I was doing a few moments ago have stopped. Where did they go? Oh, I just stopped doing them. And when I stopped doing them, they go away. How about that? Um, but when things just pop up all on their own, well, then just don't get involved. Don't pay any attention. It's kind of like when you're walking through the park and you overhear somebody else's conversation, but you don't care. Uh, you just walk past without stopping and chatting with them. Uh, just have the same attitude towards the thoughts that appear in your mind, like you're overhearing a conversation that you're not interested in, uh, and just let it let it fade away. Uh, then there won't be any problem. Okay. Um, also, the um, just a reminder. Also, some prep work <laughs> to kind of create a bit of antidotes for uh, craving and aversion, just to cultivate. Well, first of all, pay attention to, to when the mind constantly looks at the mark of the beautiful as the as the Buddha describes it. So how we are constantly looking at, oh, how great, you know, things in the, in the world are. And instead, actually, um, perhaps instead of uh, cultivating too much suba in the mind, we can do a bit of asuba. So um, focusing on the, the mark of the unattractiveness of whatever we're obsessed with. And then when it comes to instead the antidote of aversion is to cultivate a mind of loving kindness. So really put that, um, that work in, into motion. And then as a consequence, then also in med informal meditation practice, um, you will have less craving and aversion pop up out of the blue. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, the more you cultivate uh, virtue in your daily life, uh, the more you cultivate mindfulness in your daily life, uh, then the easier it is to have a peaceful mind when you practice meditation. So we can never separate our meditation from the rest of our life. Uh, we're training our mind from the moment we wake up in the morning till the moment we fall asleep in the evening, we're training our mind. But what are we training our mind to do? Most of the time, we're training our mind to be greedy, irritable, and distracted. Uh, so then you sit down to do some meditation and your mind does exactly what you've been training it to do all day long. No surprises there. So make sure that you're training your mind all day long uh, to be peaceful, to be alert, to be gentle, uh, to be wise, to be uh, equanimous, 
And then when you do meditation, it will be much easier. And Dwayne asks, how are these different from nuns? How are what different from nuns? Yeah, I don't know if we missed it. Maybe us. Uh, <laughs> well, we different from I can answer this a little bit. To be honest, <laughs> I don't know much about nuns um, since I wasn't raised Catholic. Um, I just have these distant memories. My mom went to a Catholic high school and she had very unflattering stories about how the nuns there treated her. Um, uh, anyway, so how are these different from nuns? Well, I am what's called a bhikkhu. Uh, so bhikkhu is a Pali word that means uh, male bhikkhuni. Uh, and to my right, we have ayasoma, who's a bhikkhuni, which is a Pali word that means female bhikkhu. And to my left, we have Bhante J, who's also a bhikkhu, which means, once again, male bhikkhuni. So this word uh, bhikkhu bhikkhuni, uh, literally it means an alms mendicant, uh, one who relies upon alms. Uh, to survive, who relies upon the generosity of others. Uh, that's literally what it means. Uh, but usually we understand it to mean a person who has taken the complete ordination within the Buddhist monastic system, uh, which involves hundreds of rules that we try to follow. Uh, and it involves living a life uh, which is dedicated to practicing the Buddhist teachings. Um, uh, as for how that's different from nuns, well, you might contact your local Catholic nunnery and, <laughs> and ask them what their life is like. And I can speak on that a bit. Okay. You've but been a nun? Who, well, <laughs> well, I mean, I went to Catholic school my whole life and I know. So, um, just, uh, I just wanted to speak on the word nun. There's a... <laughs> You say I, that I, was so much vehement. No, I mean, some nuns I didn't like and some nuns I still love. It's okay. Um, no, <laughs> the word nun is is something that I don't like being used in terms of, um, like when we use English words, uh, we'll say monk and nun for bhikkhu and bhikkhuni. And if you know the Catholic tradition, like a priest or a monk is not equal to a nun, right? There, there's a, There's a strong difference there. Um, and a bhikkhu and a bhikkhuni are much more like kind of like on the same level in terms of what they actually are. Like, I mean, it's literally the same word decline for, for gender. I mean, it's, it's the same word. Um, so yeah, a, a nun is, is in, in terms of hierarchy, in terms of, um, rank is, is quite less than a, uh, like a, a priest or a monk. So this is a, a word that I tend to avoid um, using when talking about uh, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. It's one of those things I just like, I just use the Pali word. It's so much better. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting just on, on that note, um, because it's also specific to the English language, because actually in Italian and as well as Spanish, um, we have two words in Catholicism for nun. Um, one is monaca. Uh, which is the female of Monaco, which is monk. So literally it's male monk and female monk. And then we have Suara, um, which is the equivalent of nun. Um, but then the male would be friar, frate. Mm. <laughs> so something got lost maybe because of the Protestants. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't bother <laughs> Too much translation in English, or like whatever those Catholics. <laughs> but it's very interesting because I looked into it because actually nun comes from nonus in um, Latin, which actually means grandfather and grandmother, nonna in um, in Italian as well as um, I think Spanish, uh, también <laughs> Spanish as well. Is that right, nonna? Uh, no. No? Okay. Then just Abuela. in Italian. Oh. Abuela. Abuela. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, very different. But in Italian, yeah. yeah, it's nonna and nonno. So actually, that's also a bit of a source of aversion. I'm working on it. <laughs> when people call me nun, I'm like, no, I'm not your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's interesting because, for example, in Italian, you would never use the word suara um for a buddhist monastic but you would use this the word monica 
it would be really weird to call anyone it would be just like a buddhist friar it's just like something or a buddhist archbishop like it's just mm. it's just not um correct as opposed to monk um and monaco monica whatever monacos comes from the greek monos which means solitary and it's actually um even when you go to Catholic monasteries, the history of monasticism is not pinpointed with the Catholic tradition, but it actually starts from the time of um, the Jains and the Buddha. And the Buddha actually at uh, the hermitage of Kamaldoi in, um, in Tuscany, he's, um, there's quite a lot of information on the Buddha praised, you know, as someone who actually established their religion like focused entirely on monasticism so all the catholics there it's a pretty you know orthodox um uh millinery monastery and they're all like wow yeah the buddha was great <laughs> with this focus on monasticism but also the emphasis on the archetype of the monastic which is why it's not just a word that belongs to catholicism or christianity but rather it's more universal which is why then at empty cloud we decided to use monk as um the gender neutral word to for both bikus and bikunis when um english-speaking people don't understand what a biku and a bikuni is and this is not our own invention. So the use of the word monk as a gender neutral or gender inclusive word is something that's been already present in the English language for decades. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're not inventing anything new by using the, the word monk in this way. So next question, Sud asks, does that mean basically sila dear to the noble ones equals all the steps in the noble eightfold path except perhaps the meditation and mindfulness part of it what do you think what if you'd like to answer i think that's a follow-up question for your your uh, then that. i would say yes minus uh right view um yeah minus right view right mindfulness and right concentration i think the other five would would all fit under uh, Arya Kanta Sila. So the Sila that's dear to the noble ones, pleasing to the noble ones. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a correct understanding. Yudi asks, did the Buddha in the form of Vajradhara teach Tantra for achieving enlightenment in this lifetime? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I've never even heard, I don't know who what Vajradhara is. I vaguely remember reading that in um, the Vajrayana account of the Buddha's awakening, right before the Buddha attained awakening, then Vajradhara Buddha appeared and delivered to him the secret tantric teachings. And that was how Shakyamuni uh, attained awakening, was following the secret tantric teachings from Vajradhara yeah. Buddha. Mm. Um, okay. yeah. Somebody explained this to me a while back, but I, I was just like, and maybe, but maybe not. I, I'm I'm more inclined to believe that the Bodhisattva attained awakening through his own effort because that's kind of what defines a Samasam Buddha. Well, there's kind of like a history of that, even isn't there? What's in the Thai tradition? There's the woman who put the hair in the water to to protect the Buddha. What do you? Say? I don't know. Well, that that's actually that's also like, doctrinally problematic. Oh, obviously, yes. But I mean, it's like I'm just pointing out that this does seem to be something that. Uh, but in September, uh, we will have Aya Santa Chitta, uh, who will be joining us for a monk chat. And Aya Santa Chitta, even though has Theravada robes, she's also a Vajrayana practitioner. Oh. So maybe that would be the best time when to ask this question, mm -hmm. since we're a bit the wrong, the wrong trio. I, I didn't know that about Aya. <laughs> yeah, yes, I think... I think Questions like this are, they are best aimed at people with experience in Tibetan Buddhism. I don't have a lot of experience with it. And the experience I do have is with the parts that are more similar to Theravada or to standard Mahayana. Um, and the second question, how can a Buddha appear in a different form once they achieve Nirvana? Well, how can they appear in a different form before they attain Nirvana? How can they appear in a different form moment by moment? Everything is always appearing in a different form all the time. So nothing is static, nothing is, is stable. Everything is constantly changing, including the appearance of a Buddha. 
So I, I don't see what the problem here is. Um, though a really lovely uh, description, which um, I'm blanking on her name, the, the American woman who's a Pureland Bikuni who came a couple of times. Wu oh, Ling. Wu Ling, yeah. Wu yeah, Ling, uh, yeah. She described it like um, all the different appearances of the Buddha are like the different facets of a jewel. Uh, so from one perspective, they all seem to be separate, but actually they're just different facets of one jewel. And I thought this was a really beautiful way of talking about it. So we talk about Shakyamuni Buddha and Vajradhara Buddha and Amitabha Buddha and Amoga Siddhi Buddha and, and all these different, different Buddhas, but fun, fundamentally there's just the Buddha. Uh, this archetype, this fundamental archetype of the Buddha. Uh, and it manifests in all these different ways uh, within samsara. Uh, but it's all just different facets of one jewel. And Thinari says, can you explain the meaning of the Sankara chanting? What is the Sankara chanting? Sapa Sankara Anicca? Like Anicca Dukkha? No, I don't know. Tinari, if you can specify the which chanting you're referring to. Um, I don't know if something maybe that she's done here at Empty Cloud. So if you can type it in, we'll, oh. we can address it better. Yeah. And Alex says, I'm really scared to be reborn without access to the Dhamma. Uh, is there any way to encourage access to Dhamma in the next life? This is great. I love <laughs> This reminds me of when I started getting into the framework framework of rebirth and I started um, having all of these thoughts um, <laughs> as well. Like, oh, wow, <laughs> I could be reborn without access to the Dhamma. I remember what it was like to not have access to the Dhamma. This is actually the great thing about being a convert Buddhist because there was some you know, time that we actually remember this time around where there was no Dhamma around. And we remember that type of suffering was significantly worse um, than the current Dukkha that we're experiencing because there was no way out. <laughs> we're like, wow, I have to just be here um, forever. <laughs> yeah, that was horrible. Yeah, that was horrible. So then when we get into the optic of rebirth, they we're like, wow, this is really, really like a realistic hypothesis. So, so I would say, um, of course, there is a way to um, encourage access to the Dhamma in the next life uh, by making sure that um, you allow others to have access uh, to the Dhamma in this life. And that can mean um, sharing the teachings in so many different ways, supporting the teachings, supporting monasteries, doing the volunteer work that you're currently doing, by the way, on Modana Satu. Uh, Alex is helping out uh, with the... Uh, uh, with the website of buddhistinsights.org. And so that's actually a way that one tangibly, essentially, um, helps spreading the Dhamma, supporting the Dhamma. And um, yeah, it's your Dhamma piggy bank for mm -hmm. <laughs> this life and the next life. Um, other very important things to do, uh, first off, establish a affinity with the Dhamma. Mm -hmm. So make sure that every day you uh, think about the Dhamma and talk about the Dhamma and read about the Dhamma and have some connection to Dhamma every day. And also make the aspiration, the aspiration, if I don't attain awakening in this life, may I be reborn with access to the Dhamma. Uh, so this is a, a standard feature across all Buddhist traditions, uh, Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana, across all Buddhist traditions. This is your daily aspiration. If I don't attain awakening in this life, may I have access to the Dhamma in my next life? So the Buddha does state quite clearly in the Pali Suttas that our aspirations like that do have power. Um, in and of themselves, they're not sufficient. They need to have good karma to back them up. But those aspirations have power. So it's important to keep that aspiration in your mind. Also, you say you're not so sure monastic life is possible for you this time around. Don't be so sure. If you really want it, then you will pursue it and you will find out if it's possible. If you don't really want it, then you won't pursue it and it won't be possible. So ultimately, it comes down to how much you want it. 
but even there don't underestimate the power of Thanam. It's actually, mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically the story of my monastic life this time around. Um, definitely um, at the very beginning of my path, I would have said exactly the same thing. I'm not sure monastic life is possible for me this time around. Um, but then it just became a reality just by, um, yeah, making, giving so much <laughs> to make the Dhamma um, available for myself and others. Uh, in this lifetime, but we don't have to necessarily, I'm not suggesting that uh, you have to open Buddhist insights number two wherever you live, but <laughs> and become a bhikkhuni, um, unless that is your call in this lifetime. But what comes to mind is actually, for example, the story of Sumeda in the Tirigata um, that actually, um, you know, was reborn a princess and she's about to get married to this prince and, you know, everything sounded pretty great on paper and she's like they're completely refusing actually she's entering jana <laughs> before getting married it's actually a pretty amusing poem uh, but then she describes how essentially she um had accrued all that incredible good karma of being able to essentially um see the the hollowness hollowness is english mm -hmm. of all the incredible sensual pleasures that she was surrounded with and all the incredible wealth both material and you know um family wise that she had uh, around it she had really good karmic conditions as a lay person but she was capable of, of piercing through all of that because actually if i remember correctly um she says she had um donated um monasteries uh, a monastery uh to uh, to the Sangha in previous lifetimes, not that lifetime. So I was not suggesting that now tomorrow I go <laughs> and donate a monastery unless you can and you want to. Uh, but yeah, I think that she shares precisely that story with us um, for posterity to really give a lesson of whenever we're supporting the Dhamma, we're making sure that not only do we have access to it, in passing by but actually we also if we're supporting something precious we understand we create that affinity that Bhante was describing we're like wow this is really worthwhile this is really a good good stuff right it's kind of interconnected okay. and jay kala says um Recently, I asked Bhante Jay this question. Do the other venerables have any particular great disciple as their personal role model or who they most relate to and learn from? Well, as I mentioned recently, I seem to have a, a particular taste for the Sariputta Suttas. So uh, if I had to pick one, yeah, Sariputta. Um, I always seem to really enjoy the suttas which are given by, by venerable Sariputta. So I have a certain feeling of, of affinity and connection with him. Um, the first one that comes to mind. I could mention more, but he's he's the first one that comes to mind. How about you? Um, any particular great disciple? Well, I really love the um, poem from Bikuni Soma, which is why I actually was named after her, because Bhante Sutazu knew that and um, suggested it to my son, Eri Preceptor, Venerable Panyavati, so that's where my name came from. And, um, but this time around, in this lifetime, I really fell in love with a uh, more recent uh, disciple <laughs> of the Buddha, Ajahn Chah. Oh. Um, that was my, like, you know, 99% maybe of the, <laughs> maybe the, people in this room, um, very common in the West. That's also the most common uh, forest monastery um, that we see in the West. But yeah, I think it's incredible. Um, Ajahn Chah's teachings are so down to earth, so real. So even though I've never met Ajahn Chah in person, um, I think he died before I was even born, I'm not sure. Or no, shortly no, thereafter. He died in 95, I believe, 1995. 95, yeah. oh. Yeah, relatively recently. It was the same But time. he was in a coma. He was in a coma for seven years. Okay. So anyway, um, I have not met him, um, but definitely made a huge impact. 
and then also all the incredible venerables that I had the opportunity to meet um, throughout my monastic life and my lay life um, at Buddhist Insights. So I'm very, very, very grateful to have met, including my brothers on the path. <laughs> um, yeah, everybody has had an incredible influence on me. That's why I'm wearing these robes. I was like, I was like, oh, this is pretty great. I want to. I want to do that too. <laughs> okay. And Julie asks, do you get heckled at all when you walk outside in your neighborhood or in the town slash city? Very rarely. <laughs> Actually, in my experience, most people are either friendly or they pretend I don't exist. Um, mostly the latter. Mostly people just pretend I'm not there, um, except when I'm not looking. Then, then they apparently stare slack jawed. Um, in some places, people will stare slack jawed even when I'm looking. Um, but mostly people are, they're either friendly or they, they pretend to not be interested. Very rarely do people heckle. What is heckle? I think I know. Oh, like to, to make rude remarks or say mean things. Sometimes though, Bante, we've had that. It's just Sometimes, that right now. Rarely. Actually, in New Jersey, where we are currently at Empty Cloud Monastery, it's really delightful. But in New York City, pretty people can be pretty harsh. I remember that. Um, I think you, you forgot, which is good. <laughs> I, that's possible. <laughs> but here, I mean, it was noticeable when we moved to New Jersey here in West Orange. It's a it's some kind of like a social utopia of the United States. <laughs> like it's like so beautiful. Everybody comes from all different parts of the world. Everybody's so happy to see us, even though they they're not Buddhist. Um, doesn't matter. They might be Muslim, Catholics, uh, even born again. Like they're happy to see us. They're like, hello, good morning. <laughs> But in New York, it was a little bit, um, yeah, it was a, on and off. Definitely a lot of stairs. Actually, when Bante Sudazo had first moved um, or first started um, staying in New York City for longer periods of time, and I was a lay person, I was taking a lot of pictures of him. And um, at a certain point, is when I was editing them to make flyers for meditation classes, um, I wanted to start this blog that was um, called <laughs> People Staring at Monastics <laughs> because in every single picture, there were all these New Yorkers like, <laughs> like all sorts of weird <laughs> faces, but very obvious and kind of disturbed. <laughs> And I thought it was hilarious. Um, so I never actually ended up doing it because it was too much work. But <laughs> but it was uh, kind of fun. And Dharma Learner says, will concentration meditation bring wisdom? If counting the breath is considered concentration meditation, then it seems to be hard to see a connection. The Buddha says that a concentrated mind sees things as they really are. So this is very important from the suttas that uh, what we would consider to be samatha and vipassana or you want to say anapanasati and satipatthana these two things are go together right the, these are in many ways they're almost the same practice right they might be different modes but it's very important to understand that they that doing a an on the cushion you know samatha practice following your breath and also doing a, you know, everyday mindfulness, trying to be mindful and clearly comprehending and all that you do, that supports each other. So, as a matter of fact, for me, the best way for me to actually have good, like being able to sit and follow my breath is after doing a bunch of walking meditation and satipatthana. Then I can actually like, you know, calm my breath and and get into deeper states but if it's just like okay bonte j just go sit down and start it's, it's a lot harder right these these two things work together um and so yes of course the buddha says that the breath brings you all the way to awakening so practicing concentration meditation samadhi is very good for developing wisdom yeah it helps to make the mind stable enough and clear enough for the mind to be able to uh cultivate insight to see uh, clearly one's experience with wisdom. Um, and 
Yeah, I mean, counting the breath is a very beginner level way of, of cultivating concentration. As your concentration becomes more mm, stable, then you stop counting and you just focus on, on feeling the sensation directly. Uh, so counting the breath is, it's, it's a beginner level practice, which beginner might mean many years, by the way. Um, but usually as your concentration becomes stronger, then you, you stop counting because the, the counting will prevent you from going deeper after a certain point. So useful in the beginning and then in the middle, it becomes uh, an obstacle and needs to be let go of. Mm -hmm. Oh, cute, Jake. Jake Alas says, we say nonna for abuela sometimes here in Argentina, informally or for Italian grandparents. Yeah, Argentina had a big Italian immigration. Yeah, it's, um, I was reading recently that I think after the United States, it's the country with the most Italian speakers outside of Italy. Yeah, we like to immigrate clearly. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> representing. Cindy says, I failed horribly at a chance to practice metta to a pack of mean girls. I was able to send metta several hours later though. Well, better late than never, as they say. Uh, but realistically, um, it's much better to cultivate metta as a vaccine beforehand, uh, rather than trying to use it at the time. Uh, so if you do a lot of metta, then the mind will be more impervious uh, to things like people being mean to you. Uh, so it's, it's more about cultivating a strength of mind, which is uh, able to uh, resist the arising of aversion in the first place. My preceptor Bhante Ji would say, you don't practice metta towards somebody coming at you with a baseball bat. Okay. Metta, metta is for before. Yeah. Yes, lots of metta as a vaccine. <laughs> And Kumo says, in Majjhima Nikaya 106, the Ananja Sapaya Sutta talks about a state called the imperturbable. What is imperturbable? So imperturbable means it's not capable of being bothered or disturbed. And this is usually a reference to the state of mind that one has when one is in, in very strong samadhi, when one is practicing meditation and one's concentration is very strong then the mind becomes impossible to be disturbed by anything. Uh, that's what that's usually talking about. Okay. And then he says, I don't remember the name exactly, but it's about the body and samsara. <laughs> we asked her to clarify that like a while back. I forgot I think the original. The sankara. Yeah. So uh, it, the so body and sankara. There's a chant we do which is about sankaras and it's about the body and sankara. Or the body and sankara. Kachana Gota Sutta? And we do that every day. Could also be a reference to the funeral chanting. I mean you were here for six months and we did a lot of different chants during those those months. So yeah, I I, I still don't know what chant you're talking about. I'm sorry. And Sud says, I gave up drinking socially ever since I took precepts seriously. Congratulations. And also read the Akankeya Sutta, great Sutta. But recently I was pushed to drink. To escape, I told them I'm avoiding for my liver. I don't have any liver problems, but is this lying? <laughs> <laughs> they backed off because they thought I had liver problems. <laughs> Hence, did I break a precept to keep another one? Aw, that's so sweet. <laughs> well, technically, I mean, if you're avoiding it also for your liver, uh, it's not lying. I mean, it's not maybe the first main reason why you're avoiding alcohol, but it's definitely a great side effect. <laughs> so it's not that you said, I'm... I'm avoiding it for my liver problems that were diagnosed by my doctor on day, et cetera, et cetera. But actually you're, you can also, you're, you can also say I'm avoiding it for my brain because actually alcohol um, se severely like damages your brain. Actually, I remember my brain was significantly much more functioning <laughs> when I 
focus in my early 20s than I am these days, I think, because actually of the large consumption of um, alcohol, my memory was much better. Like there were so many things. That's why, you know, uh, last week I was like, someone asked me, what would you tell your younger self? Like go to the monastery and take the precepts. <laughs> I invested, I wasted rather than invest. I wasted so much energy actually. And so much, so many resources, like also physical resources, the body doesn't get enlightened, but it definitely like helps you out to obtain awakening, um, the more functioning it is. So yes, you're avoiding it for your liver. That will help you towards awakening. Um, I don't see any, any kind of problem with that. Yeah, actually, Samran Aramatico recently pointed out, they did some research on what the maximum safe dosage of alcohol is. Um, and he said they concluded the safe dosage is less than one tablespoon. So that's pretty small. That's a pretty minute amount. Um, so yeah, realistically, if you want to keep your liver healthy, the best amount of alcohol to drink is zero. They don't read Italian reports on wine because they're a little bit different. Um, but no, I, honestly, also, I think if, if somebody asks you, you can actually just tell them, like, because I took the Buddhist mm -hmm. precepts, and one of the Buddhist precepts is not to consume any alcohol. I think it's actually fine to just be completely upfront yes. about that. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think it's it's the best option. Mm. And it's fine to to play the physical health card because that's also true. Any amount of alcohol is bad for your body. Um, but I think it's it's better just to be really clear. Like I do this as part of my spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to me like you, you were trying to kind of find a way to have them stop bothering you. So what, you just use whatever first came up. Um, but as Bonte says, like, even think about it now. You had this experience. I think, okay, from here on in, if anybody says something, I'm going to pull out my Buddhist card. And I'm going to say <laughs> You know, I have taken these vows and, and I, I don't drink. I'm a Buddhist. And if you're firm enough and if it's people that you, you know, engage with on a regular basis, they will actually, in my opinion, in my experience, they will accept that and they will respect that. And they maybe even say, well, do you want to come and be a designated driver or something like that? <laughs> That's what happened to me when I, I was fairly young. I was in my early 30s. Yeah, but like late, late, you know, like 31, 32 when I stopped drinking when because I started taking the precepts and I just became designated driver. And I was just very firm. And I said, sorry, I know we used to drink, but I don't do it anymore. And they just they accepted it after a time. So, yeah, have good confidence, confidence in, in your Buddhist practice and say, nope, I'm done and I'm a Buddhist and this is what we do. No problem. It's true, actually. Uh, thank you both for, for pointing that out. That's what I also did. I actually didn't use the B word because I wasn't Buddhist technically at the time. <laughs> I just said that I was, um, yeah, that I wasn't drinking because I was meditating. So I was very clear and and uh, to the point. And you, yes, there was tons of peer pressure. But then after a while, actually, the peer pressure really helped me in um, taking the leap and actually... <laughs> <laughs> the precepts formally paradoxically but that's because my my mind works a little bit um how do you say the bastian contrario um whatever other people tell me i like to do the opposite <laughs> so thanks to my non-buddhist friends <laughs> i became buddhist more rapidly <laughs> And uh, also, actually, they helped me in creating this passion because then I was hanging out with them in New York City. So I was not even the driver because <laughs> nobody drives in New York and I didn't have a license. But I developed a lot of this passion because everybody was getting drunk around me and I was sober. And then you actually realize also what a waste of time this all is. And you're kind of like completely uninterested to begin with. It doesn't even become a sacrifice anymore. So, yeah. True, true. Go, mm -hmm. uh, go the, use the B word. And Life's a Trip says, I'm having anxiety and do not want to use the medication being discussed by my mental health professional. Can meditation help? And if not, will prescription drugs hinder my ability to find jhanas? So you're getting into a very dangerous field, which is the field of attempting to self-treat mental illness. That works for close to 0% of people. So 
Uh, it's true that psychiatric medications are sometimes not particularly fun. They're sometimes not particularly pleasant. Uh, but you do need to be realistic. Uh, sometimes they actually are the best option. Uh, so usually someone takes a multi-pronged approach where they're going to uh, counseling sessions, they're taking some medication, and maybe they're also doing certain meditation practices uh, and also doing lifestyle changes. Um, so that's actually a really important thing. Uh, what are you doing in your daily life that's contributing to your, your mental difficulties? So sometimes changing your lifestyle makes a big difference. So multi-pronged approach and all of these together then will help you start to improve your, your condition. Mm -hmm. But if you just think that you can stop talking to your doctor and stop taking your pills and just do a bunch of meditation, and if, if you think that's going to solve your problems, so I've got some bad news for you. One, that's probably not going to solve your problems. And two, it might even make your problems worse. So yes, meditation is a very powerful way of training the mind, but it is not necessarily a substitute for mental health treatments. Uh, so I, I don't particularly recommend trying to self-treat um, these kinds of issues. I, I'd only like to add that, um, yeah, you know, when it comes to medications, uh, a lot of times people with mental health stuff, they, they have a lot of trial problems with a lot of different medications. And in this point, you have to be your own advocate, right? So you don't like what the, that's the, the specific medication. Well, learn about other medications, bring it up, talk to your doctor, right? No, we're, we're not going to, <laughs> we're not going to advocate uh, not talking to your doctor and just going to meditate. That's not a, that's not a viable option. So be your own advocate but, and your own practitioner and learn as best as you can and uh, have a discussion. Um, yeah, and, and I don't think that prescription drugs will necessarily hinder your jhana practice. Mm. Um, in fact, you might, you might actually find that the crippling anxiety is hindering your jhana practice and that getting some mental health, uh, your mental health help uh, might actually make it easier for you to practice meditation. And Hai Ang asks, is attachment to the Dhamma a hindrance to enlightenment? As Buddha said, the Dhamma is only a guide. How and when do we let go of attachment to the Dhamma? So what comes to mind is actually um, the instructions that the Buddha gives um, in the Tirigata to um, one of the theories, I can't remember which one, where he says, attach yourself to the Dhamma, bound yourself to the Dhamma. <laughs> and then um, basically it ends, then when you'll be free, by attaching yourself to the Dhamma, you will be free from all attachments. Uh, that's how it ends. So it's a means to an end, uh, but it's kind of funny how, you know, this is actually high end question is one of the frequently asked questions. I kind of find it funny how, you know, most of us um, start immediately thinking about detaching from the Dhamma instead of detaching from all the ocean of attachments that we have. We're like, we're like oh, I'm smart here with this non-attachment. How about I attach to the only one thing that I need to attach right now? Like not attach to the only one thing that I need, right? No, no. <laughs> so instead of detaching from Netflix, I'll detach from the Dhamma. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all I needed to do all this time was not attaching to the Dhamma. <laughs> and that, yes, has worked so much, <laughs> so well, all these countless lifetimes. Um, so yeah, of course, the, um, the, you know, the most famous teaching of the Buddha is actually the simile of the raft. Uh, where the Buddha addresses this precisely, um, where like, okay, if you're on one shore and you need to reach the other shore and you have a raft, of course, you jump on the raft, uh, you use the raft, but it's not when you're like halfway um, in the middle of the two shores, you're, you toss the raft and you drown. No, you get <laughs> to the other end of the shore and then it would be ridiculous to then carry the raft 
um, with you. Oh, that's the time you, you caused the raft. So in other words, don't worry about um, not attaching to the Dhamma. Uh, you're not there yet. When you will be there, <laughs> you will just <laughs> not, not be attached anymore to anything. So in the meanwhile, attach yourself to that raft. Attach yourself to the Dhamma. Bound yourself. Glue yourself. Like super attach, uh, super attach yourself. Super glue. Super glue. <laughs> And Norberto has questions about coming to stay at Empty Cloud. So send send an email to the monastery email address. You can find it on the website. Uh, and they'll have you'll get all the information that you need. It says are all dates open or suggested periods? All dates are open, but not like the next week in the sense we don't say, Oh, I want to come the day after tomorrow because we will probably read it next week. So, um. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's good to give at least one week advance notice. Yeah, or so. Um, and Dharma Learner says, how can we determine when to give up counting the breath? Are there milestones or such to signify when to move on? So after the mind starts to become quiet and uh, relatively quiet and relatively still, and you can feel the sensation of your breath without getting distracted very much, then try dropping the breath counting and just focus on feeling the sensation directly without the counting. Uh, and if you very quickly start to get distracted and lost, then come back to counting. But if you find that you're able to stay with the breath sensation without wandering around too much, then keep going without doing the counting. And this is how you know the difference between uh, Bhante Sudaso and Bhante Yutadamo, because Bhante Yutadamo mm -hmm. doesn't ever say to stop the count. Oh, interesting. <laughs> the noting. Oh, then, right? yeah, the noting. Yeah. Well, that's, but that's a different the, method, no? It is. And it's also a method which deliberately avoids um, samadhi practice. Yeah. So that's, um, I'm more of a samadhi vipassana person rather than a only Vipassana person. Not Bhante Yutadam. Yes, that's because he teaches strictly pure Vipassana. I'm saying you're not. And they're two different people. Yeah. I, yeah, I, exactly. I am in fact, trying to say. This, yeah. this is proof that I am not Bhante Yutadam. <laughs> in case you were wondering. Um, Frank asks, if the purpose of chanting is recollection, is that the only purpose? I think there's more to it than that. If the purpose of chanting is recollection, why chant in Pali over English? Well, for one, I know Pali. So for me, chanting in Pali is not a problem. Are you saying you don't know Pali? Maybe you should learn <laughs> Pali. But actually, there's more to chanting than just recollection. There's also that it gives you a feeling of connection to the Buddha. Uh, and a, a feeling of connection to uh, 2,600 years of bhikkhus and bhikkhunis who have been reciting these texts. Uh, and a sense of, yeah, this, this intimate involvement in this, this ancient tradition of, of following the Buddha's words. So there's, there's more to it than just recollection. It's also just so beautiful going mm -hmm. to like Asia and um, being capable of following the chanting. Um, it really gives you this sense of connection, of shared practice with the tradition of 2,500 years, as Bhante said, but also the living tradition of today. That was just so special. Yeah, once again, I had no zero Thai, but I could chant together with Thai people. Um, so there's this beautiful way of, um, yeah, sharing, having in common what is what is precious. And as um, someone did Amatiko was was saying that I don't know if people have overheard. It's actually a very great way to learn Pali, to understand um, the Pali words and start questioning perhaps our understanding of, you know, if we only know the translated thing, it's um, it's very much telephone game. <laughs> but instead, if we have a reference for the Pali, then we can start asking the right questions maybe. And James Lee says, as one of the Bhantas explained, with a concentrated mind, one sees things as they are. Does this mean seeing the appearance of things as they are in front of us without judgment or seeing the nature of things such as impermanence, emptiness, illusionary nature of things? Both. 
Uh, so when the mind is steady and stable, then you can be aware of perceptions, uh, sensations without distortion. Uh, and also if you direct your attention to paying attention to the impermanence and emptiness of things, then it will be much easier to do so because the mind is stable and clear and alert. Uh, so both. Okay. Scott says, I notice strong suffering associated with abandonment. Any comments? 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 Abandonment? Well, I mean, it depends on what you mean, what kind of, what you mean by abandonment. Um, you know, ultimately, we abandon everything. Like the path is abandoning everything, letting go of everything. And that's not something that we, that we're ready to do so until after a lot, a lot of practice. So yes, and, and when we feel either abandoned by somebody has left us or a relationship broke down or somebody died or there's this huge gulf, this loss, right? And of course, then that's suffering, right? So and, and anything that we are separated from where we did not want that separation to happen, there will be suffering. Right? If we have an attachment, when there is some kind of abandonment, either intentional or unintentional or whatever, there will be suffering. Right? And this is because of our attachments, because of what, that we cling to things that are impermanent. We think that they are permanent, stable, dependable. And when we think that, we set ourselves up. It's like a ticking time bomb for when the uh, Anicca will show itself. And there will be some kind of abandonment. Okay. And Kristen asks, what are the Venerable's views on psychedelic therapy, not for recreation? Marketing. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's also a follow-up question. I saw this book that tried to link Tibetan imagery practices with psychedelics and wasn't sure what to make of it. Marketing. So that's the problem, you know, these days that there's always this tendency towards capitalism. So not tendency, everything is <laughs> capitalistic, everything is a product. And, you know, people kind of get bored with uh, just the plate to sell and purchase. So then they're like, oh, plate with the uh, little whatever golden things. And then they get bored with the plate with the golden things. So you're like, oh, plate of a different fabric or plate that shines or plate that flies uh, while you're eating it or plate that then transforms into a spoon and blah, 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 blah. So it's the same thing with um, especially spirituality because you can decline it in um in so many different random whatever silly ways um and basically they're always selling the same fluff um <laughs> but they kind of call it in different ways i would say that i mean we're trying to see things as they are so we have the dhamma we have the teachings of the Buddha. Let's try to stay as grounded as possible because um, psychedelics can be fun. You can also get also some nice insights, but you can also get these insights with so much confusion and delusion that mm -hmm. then will exasperate um, whatever other delusion that, that you have going on. So I don't know. Why waste time? We've wasted so many eons and lifetimes. Um, I would focus on actually the question that Alex has said, how can we be sure, you know, that, that we have the Dhamma um, and take advantage also, I would add uh, the opportunity that we have right now of having the Dhamma. Let's follow the teachings of the Buddha without getting too confused. Mm -hmm. Amir says, can the mind be aware of only one Kanda at a time? Well, pay attention to the mind. See, see for yourself. Uh, yes, I think it's Tinari is Anichavata Sankara, oh. as it says. Oh, that's at the end of the funeral chanting. Mm -hmm. um, so the funeral chanting, um, I don't know how Bhante Sumita does it, but the way we usually do it starts Kusala Dhamma, Kusala Dhamma, Abhyakata Dhamma, uh, etc. Uh, and then at the very end, we say Anichavata Sankara, Upadvaya Dhammino, etc. Uh, so does that sound familiar? 
Propagitva Nirujan. Yeah, so I think she's in B, Dante, if you can say not that well, means. Uh, first off, just pointing out, Frank M gives a shout out, a uh, positive Yelp review for anxiety medication as a support to meditation practice. This is if you have an anxiety problem. If you don't have an anxiety problem, don't start popping pills. Um, but if you do have an anxiety problem and your doctor recommends um, a dosage of a particular anxiety medication, it might be worth trying it out and seeing how it goes. It might help you out. Um, anyway, the funeral chanting, well, it actually starts with a, a long listing of uh, various categories from the Abhidhamma, uh, which I'm, I'm not normally a big fan of Abhidhamma, but that chant is actually a lot of fun to chant. So. And, and it's a basically just a listing of Dhamma categories, which are describing all of them in depth would take me a, a few hours. So I won't do that. But the brief chant down the end, Anichavata Sankara Upadvai Dhamino Upajitra Nirajante Te Sangu Pasamosako, says um, all things are impermanent, subject to arising and ceasing. Um, um, having, having arisen, they then cease. And Te Sangu Pasamosako, so happiness is their tranquility. So the tranquility of Sankara, so pacifying Sankaras is happiness. Um, yep. And we have a couple more questions here. Jaykala says, do you have any opinions on having creative outlets while practicing Dhamma, such as poetry or forms of writing? Do you think it's generally best avoided or have you found benefit? I personally have no creative outlets, only translation. That's my only creative outlet. I do now with the Teri Zin, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just because um, there are really not that many illustrations or depictions of bikunis um, available, and I translated the Terigata, then I just started drawing <laughs> bikunis out of necessity. But that's kind of like it was kind of fun, and actually it also helped me contemplate the. Um, um, contemplate the words of the deities in a, in a different way while I was drawing, obviously, like kind of bringing up their verses. So yes, as with anything, I would say the question is always, what is the end result? So is it bringing you closer uh, to the Dhamma or away from the Dhamma? Is it nurturing wholesome mind states or is it diminishing wholesome mind states? Are your unwholesome mind states diminishing or are they increasing? So, of course, we want to get um, always increasing the wholesome and diminishing the unwholesome and getting, yeah, bound, attaching ourselves to the Dhamma more and more. So then the answer is always very clear to us. Yeah, I and mean, I know a few other monks who do some kind of creativity so whether it's drawing or painting or uh, other forms of creativity and and also talk about how it's uh, supportive to their practice um ajahn Jyoti palo comes to mind uh, he's a monk who i've known since before i was ordained um, and he uh, likes to paint uh, especially painting uh, both buddhist monastics and also also catholic saints and also scenes from monastic life. He does a, and, and he always talks about how this has been uh, one of the most transformative things in his monastic life was when he started to do this painting practice. He said it was incredibly supportive. Um, so yeah, yeah, these things can be supportive. Um, and last question, Scott says, I have terrible trouble with getting distance from and not believing thoughts, any advice? And if you want to answer this question, Jay. Um, until you start to have insights into not self and realize that the thoughts aren't yours, that's going to be your normal modus operandi. That's going to be, um, we automatically just accept that, that the thoughts are me, mine, and myself. Right? Uh, I think one of the things that I would say is you're terrible trouble getting distance and not believing thoughts don't don't treat thoughts as an enemy 
right? Don't don't try to treat thoughts as something that's intrusive or that you need to try to push away. Do not do that. Now, if you're having um, like very dark thoughts and things like that, which we all do. I mean, I, I'm sure that there's nobody listening to this that hasn't thought about killing somebody or doing something like that. We all have lots of dark thoughts in our mind uh, that we would never actually say in public, right? And so that's also part of the mind, right? To observe and to understand these different aspects of the mind. Remember, we're trying to understand and investigate. We're not trying to control, manipulate, or suppress. It's very important to understand this. You're trying to see things as they are, to know them very deeply. So, you know, the thoughts that arise, you're automatically going to accept them as yours until you don't anymore. So that's going to, you know, take, require some sincere practice over a long period of time. So until that point, just view thoughts as things that you can investigate. Oh, another opportunity to investigate something. And also to laugh at. The mind is the most interesting. The mind is better than Jerry Springer or whatever, <laughs> Maury Povich or whatever, the, you know, any kind of wacky TV. The mind is like the most interesting thing to observe in existence. So just observe it. Just have some fun with it. Be lighthearted with it. and Just watch the mind be nutty because it is. Let's just start to notice that thoughts seem to appear of their own accord. So if they're appearing of their own accord, then it can't possibly be you, can it? And that's the last question. So I think we'll go ahead and end at this time. So thank you all for joining in and please continue uh, with our uh, live streams every week. And if you're in the area, you can come and visit the monastery on the weekends. So we'll end with three sadhus. Sadhu. Sadhu, 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 and we'll see you next time. <laughs>